Great. So uh, as you can imagine, I've stolen a bunch of this from our course. So you're going to get sort of a, um, a, a, a mini, um, uh, you know, taste of, of a much longer story about regenerative economics. Um, I think this quote by Thomas Berry pretty much sums up where we are, not just um, in our economy, but in our, in our civilization, uh, which is that we're, we're in trouble because we no longer have a good story. The story we tell ourselves about how the world works and how we fit into it isn't working. And we haven't yet developed a new story. And, and um, I, think, I think the work that Laura's doing and I'm doing are, are um, trying to put some um, parameters around this new story, or not parameters around, but to, to share this, this new story, which Thomas Berry, uh, I think, is one of the, one of the early uh, promoters of with his work on um, uh, ecological civilization. Um, but from very much from a the, um, theological perspective. Um, if we zoom down to the economy, the economy is a, is a subsystem of society, of civilization, but in the 21st century, it's become the dominant institution that influences so much of um, our behavior, our way of living, our way of thinking, that it's, it's sort of become the the religious we all, the religion we've all bought into or had to buy into in order to live in the world, and of course economic growth, uh, I, I refer to as the Church of Economic Growth, reigns supreme, and this is true irrespective of political ideologies. You know the the uh, the Chinese strategy is economic growth. Um, the Scandinavian strategies are economic growth dependent, and of course the more um, extreme neoliberal capitalist systems like the United States um, are predicated on economic growth. And that's not just a good thing for shareholders that, you know, our entire government tax system uh, is predicated on economic growth. Our pension systems are predicated on economic growth. So if you, if you pull the thread of economic growth, um, pretty much civilization crumbles uh, is, is, is the hard truth. And so, of course, the, um, uh, the man who, who invented the GNP indicators, which are how we measure economic growth, warned us at the time of his Nobel Prize many, many decades ago that, that the welfare of a nation is um, uh, unrelated to measures of national income. But we didn't listen to that part. And we've created an economic system that is predicated on this idea of exponential growth forever. And the exponential function is probably one of the least understood and most powerful uh, ideas uh, that humanity has created. But of course, uh, many, many decades ago, um, we understood from a physics point of view that economic gro exponential growth on a finite planet doesn't work. And um, uh, Kenneth Boulding has a particular clever way of saying this, anyone who believes exponential growth can go on forever in a finite world is either a madman or an economist. And unfortunately, there's a lot of truth to that. Um, and economists will give you all kinds of reasons why that's not crazy, um, but it is literally crazy. It's in conflict with the second law of thermodynamics. And in the course that I'm teaching, I, I, I've actually explored the, the origin of this error and, um, and it's actually an interesting story. I'll give you the, the brief version of it um, here today, but it, it dates back to the scientific revolution. And like many things that we're stuck in today, um, they date back to the scientific revolution, which had all kinds of positive attributes, um, but, but also I will argue has laid the groundwork for um, the existential crises that is facing humanity today. And this is true, not just in economics, but in all of our uh, fields of knowledge. Um, but there's another thing that happened roughly around the same time. And interestingly for me, I just discovered this um, uh, since moving to Eastern Connecticut. Mystic Connecticut is literally, you know, three miles from where I'm sitting. 
and right around the same time, uh, the first um, genocide occurred here in North America. And for the, um, for the, the, the global eco economic system to become, you know, centered on what's happening in the United States, you know, I think it's fair to say the US economy has become the bellwether, both in terms of scale and power, but also in terms of ideological belief and system design and theoretical foundation. Um, we essentially stamped out any possibility that indigenous wisdom would remain at the table um, through this event that occurred literally down the street from where I've chosen to live. And um, um, th th there's a long story behind this, but, but this picture sort of summarizes it. After um, uh, Adam Smith, uh, who was a political philosopher, de developed his idea on classical economics back in the late 1700s, right around the time of the US and French Revolution, um, in the next roughly 100 years, uh, classical economics was um, developed into a quote unquote science uh, by something that's called or with something called neoclassical economics. And neoclassical economics boils down to an assumption that, um, uh, well, let me back up and say, Newton was kind of the, the hero in, in, you know, in the, in the uh, late 18th century. Um, uh, and, and these political philosophers were looking up to Newton and seeing all the prestige that he had and just made an assumption that like there are Newtonian laws uh, in, in mechanics that explain mm -hmm. the, the world of matter and the world of energy, there had to be equivalent laws that would describe the natural state of the economy. And that was just a bold-faced assumption. And from my reading, the physicists at the time told the neoclassical economists that they were crazy and that that made no sense. But you can see this is a page out of the textbook of Irving Fisher, who was one of the fathers of neoclassical economics. And there were several, and they all pursued this same line of the same assumption. They literally transposed, for example, the, the particle in mechanics, Newtonian mechanics, to the individual in an economy. Um, and energy was transposed into utility. This idea of the utility function in, uh, in economics is, you know, what's, um, what's the use of, of some um, uh, activity? What's the marginal utility? And, it, and it's, it's like, it doesn't make any sense, and yet it's never been questioned. Believe it or not, it's never been questioned. And so whether it's Keynesian economics, Keynes was, was taught by a neoclassical economist, and we, this leads us all the way into 2018, where the Nobel Prize in Economics, which by the way, is not a legitimate Nobel Prize, it's a prize awarded by the Swedish Central Bank in honor of Nobel in an attempt to give uh, scientific um, legitimacy to the field of economics. This, this just, every time I say this, it stuns me. The Nobel Prize was awarded to William Nordhaus in 2018 for a model that concluded, his, his economic model concluded that three and a half degrees warming would be the optimal temperature to shoot for because anything lower, meaning the scientific consensus of below one and a half degrees would literally in his words, cost too much. And there's this presumption that the economy is somehow separate and wealth is somehow separate from the foundation uh, uh, biosphere integrity upon which the economy sits. And it's again, can be traced back to this uh, reductionist mindset that is the scientific method that created all of this uh, progress, but also is so dangerously uh, ignorant of how the universe and how the world actually works. Um, so, you know, the, the punchline here is that in, in the field of economics, I'm suggesting that we're literally lost. Um, we're trapped in a fog of neoclassical economics. There's been multiple patches to this uh, over, the, over the decades. Nobel Prize is awarded for these patches, but never has the economics profession acknowledged that Newtonian physics is not the correct foundation for 
uh, economics, and they haven't even gone back and adjusted the theoretical framework for the advance of quantum physics. And of course, most physicists will acknowledge that they don't really understand quantum physics. But the one thing that there seems to be a consensus about is that the, the idea that everything is connected to everything. And so the, the, the most important understanding from physics is in conflict with neoclassical economics, much less any attempt to move it to a living systems framework. Um, and of course, the, 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 the symptoms of this are, are many, uh, from the grotesque inequality that exists to the breaching of planetary boundaries that I'm sure you've all um, seen. And if you haven't, I encourage you to take a look at it. The punchline here is that climate change is just one of nine planetary boundaries. And um, we're in breach of other ones even more uh, excessively than we are in the, in the carbon cycle. So we're, we need to shift our thinking into this concept of complexity. And, and complexity and complexity science is relatively new. Um, of course, Dana Meadows and, and the, the famous book written literally 50 years ago this year, uh, Limits to Growth, was born out of complexity science PhDs at, at MIT. But, but we generally, as a, as a you know, educated population, don't understand that there's a difference between what's complicated and what's complex. And a, you know, a, a rocket ship or a computer or an iPhone is complicated. And there's a reductionist way to figure out how to build the best rocket ship or computer. And there's a solution to that problem. Complexity, on the other hand, is, there, are no, there are no solutions to complexity. Complexity is a process we need to learn to dance with, to work with. And so, for example, the United Nations and the Palestinian question is a complex question. And there's no simplistic right, wrong way to address an issue like that. And, and I would suggest that most things that really matter in this world from our own, the health of our own body to a healthy family, <clears throat> to a healthy nation, to a healthy company, uh, and to a healthy economy is a question of complexity. And yet our theoretical framework is one designed around Newtonian physics, which is much better in, in, in a reductionist mindset, which is good at dealing with questions that are complicated. And so it's not working and no surprise. Now in complexity, things don't change incrementally. They change very little until the pressure builds and then they change um, uh, radically what complexity scientists call phase shift transitions. And an example of that is when you put a pot of water on a stove and turn up the heat, initially nothing happens. Um, if, the, if, if it starts as ice, eventually the ice melts. If it's a liquid, eventually the liquid starts to boil. But these are, these are radical shifts that happen suddenly uh, in response to pressure. Uh, and, and most of our attempts to deal with the economic system and its problems presume that change happens incrementally and, and, um, and, not, and not subject to these phase shift transitions despite the fact that we experience phase shift transitions all the time. And um, you know, the, the Berlin Wall falling down is a phase shift transition, but so is the Ukrainian war. And so is the whole, uh, what I would call the, the Trump phenomenon and what's happening in our, in our politics. Uh, these things are not predictable and uh, not manageable in the sense of uh, managing complicated problems their complexity playing out and we need to learn to work in a complex world, not in a complicated world. That, that's a big shift. I think that shift is probably bigger than the shift from the medieval era when we look to the church for our understanding of how the universe works. Um, we had a religion that taught us right and wrong, truth and not truth, and then the scientific era began and we could use our own uh, analytical minds to calculate and, and, and understand things better, which was a radical shift. And I'm sure very disconcerting for people living in that time. But the shift that's happening now is at least as big and I suspect bigger and certainly the implications are bigger because the literally literal future of life on this planet 
human and non-living is exposed and, and being affected by it. This shift to what I'll call the regenerative era, um, maybe the integral era is a better name for it, although I think we need to move through this regenerative understanding in, if we're ever to, going to reach the integral era. But the, 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 the paradigm is fundamentally different. And it's, it's a shift from reductionist thinking and understanding the world as a machine to holistic thinking and understanding the world as an ecosystem, uh, much more in alignment with the truth that, that our science tells us it really is, as well as our indigenous wisdom. 